panelists, thank you for being here. Um, we're going to have a half hour, 40 minutes talk about bridging channel uh, experiences and challenges we face. Um, my name is Michael Stratov. I'm a founder of 100% Email, email marketing agency. But all we do is uh, looking at data from all our channels for our customers and how can we build the right email automation in place for them. So that's what we do for a lot of big customers in, uh, in the Netherlands. So maybe introduce yourself and we kick off. Mike. Okay, I'm uh, Michael Al. I'm uh, self-employed since eight, year, eight years and I, um, I'm a consultant in CRM and database marketing. And besides that, I'm an interim data protection officer. Don't spam me with questions, please. <laughs> and um, I've done several uh, assignments already in several different branches, and I hope to, uh, to tell you something about it today in this panel. All right, Jeroen Brink. I'm with uh, Sanema, which is a large media publisher throughout Europe, uh, based in the Netherlands. And among other media, we publish around 40 uh, different magazines in the Netherlands. Uh, they're very successful magazines. Uh, five of them are in the top 10 of most read magazines. Uh, so we have some skill. And I uh, am for online sales and e-commerce for those magazines, uh, selling subscriptions and uh, single copies, uh, online channels and, uh, and web shops. And in all of our campaigns, email is actually very important. Uh, but what we find is that email is especially effective when used in combination with other channels. Uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, sharing some of those examples with you uh, today. Hi, I'm Dave Holland. Um, uh, my qualification of being on a panel with three other Dutchmen is that my name is Holland. I can't think. <laughs> I'm not an expert in. <laughs> um, we work with dozens and dozens of brands globally. Them get moment of open live content and targeting into their email campaigns, and that does involve a lot of cross-channel marketing data as well, so uh, yeah, we'll probably end up talking about that. I'm based in the UK. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Um, so I want to start with uh, one broad question is, what is your vision, uh, Mike, maybe we can start with you, mm. on uh, what is your experience, how to build these, these bridges between all these channels we can use? Some things already were said in the, in the panel uh, this, this morning already that you have to, uh, you have to uh, to, uh, to get rid of the sub uh, in my opinion, you have to do that, and I agree with the, with the, the, the former panel. Uh, you have to do that from a data, uh, database point of view. So, which data do you have? Um, which channels uh, are you willing to, uh, to connect to your database? Um, from there on, you can start thinking of uh, which data do I want to connect with each other to get a, a richer profile. And uh, hopefully, in some organizations, mm -hmm. there's something like a preference center where you, as a customer, can tell which your uh, uh, primary channel is, where you want to speak to uh, uh, the specific brand, and then it's easy to use that uh, to use that channel. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think also um, it's very appealing to look at email as a separate channel, and um, uh, it might be very appealing to then uh, look at the last click conversion and things that you get out of email directly. Um, I think in true multi-channel campaigns, it starts with being uh, emails as a touch point, uh, believing that you perhaps have to reach out to your consumer like six times before there's an actual conversion. And in that, email plays a very important role and adds like another touch point. Um, so you should be happy when it's, it's not a direct sale that comes from email, uh, but you should look at the role that email, email plays. And um, that's actually not, it's, um, it's, it's a lot about creativity and using the data that you get from email uh, in your other channels. Um, yes, I'm, my most recent thoughts on cross-channel marketing is that there is only marketing and marketing includes cross-channel marketing. There is, you can't have marketing without cross-channel marketing, so it's almost a bit of a mute point. Um, but I also think that um, joining the dots by the way, for that masterclass. I thought it was an awesome presentation. Thank you. Um, and we've 
seen um, what Maryland has been doing over the last two or three years. We work with their US, um, out of their US team as well with, with Live Clicker. Um, one of the things I think that we've um, seen a trend is that the, um, the data piece is the central play. Um, and I don't think we can escape that. So those brands that are hooking all of that data up from apps, from uh, social media, through the ESPs particularly, so any, anybody who's using um, a marketing cloud ES based ESP are generally the ones who seem to be winning the race on that. Um, but I also want to throw in some other channels which all allude to. One is TV. Um, I, um, my wife bought me a piece of so watch, it's a Swiss comic joke here. So my wife bought, recently bought me for our wedding anniversary a Tissot watch, it was great. And she said to me, uh, what kind of watch do you want? You need a new watch, what kind of watch do you want? And so can anybody guess what I was doing when she was asking the question on television? No. Nope. Try though. No, not even close. Oh, ooh. rugby. Rugby, Six Nations, okay. So I was watching Six Nations, which sounds really boring, but um, as you know, they, 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 they're all over Six, Rugby Six Nations. So I'm a millennial, I think, uh, baby boomer body. Um, <laughs> because... I've been looking at all kinds of watches, but it just had a T so that it was on the billboard Six Nations. So that's really boring. But um, I recognise that you know I'm in the minority now. But we should forget that. And also point of sale. Um, if point of sale is not in the channel mix, uh, either as a data influencer or as another opportunity to market, then I think that's something that, that uh, is worth looking at as well. So. Okay. Well, my. <coughs> We also work, for example, for a company called uh, TUI, you might uh, know this. And um, I actually spoke to the CEO of TUI last week, and he mentioned that he has three key strategy pillars for growth in years. One is to optimize his availability of hotels and being really dynamic in which hotels or which countries are applicable. And the second, I've got the third, so I, I only remind the second, he said CRM. CRM is the most valuable strategy for, for our growth in, in the future. We invested a lot in, in infrastructure. Um, so it was a good takeaway for me. And he also mentioned that, well, we don't have to see buildings from an inside out view. Because he said, well, for example, in the Nordics, TUI doesn't have any offices anymore. Whereas in the Netherlands, we don't have officers yet, right? So being digital doesn't mean you don't have to be online as well. So you have to be there where your customers are. And it sounds really simple. Um, By offices, do you mean retail outlets? Retail outlets, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm set off. Yeah. Retail outlets. Yeah, so uh, be there, yeah. And being omnichannel as well doesn't need to be that uh, you need to use every channel. Uh, you just see where, where your customers are and take the data. You don't right. want to. Right, I, I totally agree. I, I think it's about relevance. And it's, um, it's, it's not always also just online marketing. Offline marketing plays a very important role. And I have an example uh, of that. For instance, like we have one of our largest magazines, which is um, uh, a design and uh, interior magazine, Vete Vode. Uh, and, and this magazine always organizes like a large scale fair, an annual fair where consumers go to. to uh, find inspiration for their, uh, their album. So what we um, combined is we started a promotion where we said like go uh, um, uh, subscribe to this magazine now and you get free tickets to the uh, to the events in a kind of value package. So hopefully we send out like an email and we were like wow this is going to be amazing. We made the best selection of like people that are uh, likely to be interested in, uh, in this and we're probably going to sell like a lot uh, via this email and it turned out that it was actually very unsuccessful um, at the end actually like one uh, less than one percent of the total 
the well, total sales within this campaign came from that email. So we went back to the drawing board and we, we thought like, well, what should we do now? And then we came up with the idea like, we actually should send the email of the people that received the email, we should send them a physical direct mail through the mail. And after that, um, we send another email. And that email was super successful. That was like 10% of our total sales from one email after we first had been in contact with like a kind of pre-launch email mm -hmm. and then the physical direct mail. And then the email results of direct sales, they, uh, they went through the roof. But that could have never happened without the combination of those uh, different channels. Interesting thought. It's, most of the time it's, uh, it's a cost thing as well, right? So Absolutely. Absolutely, but it's um, uh, we have another example also where we uh, we've been very successful with our mail. Um, Olf also mentioned like uh, you get a lot of data from your email database. So what we did is we uh, made a selection of like uh, people that were in our email database, and we coupled that with zip codes. So we looked at like where do these people actually live that are in our email database. So we expanded the, the zip codes and we found some majorities of like, um, basically like, like that it was like more likely for our uh, prospects and, uh, and consumers uh, to be living in a certain zip code. So we mapped out all of the Netherlands. And then we sent out this direct mail in combination with email and other, other, other channels. And then we sent out like just from like this um, uh, direct mail, uh, which was sent to a uh, minimum um, uh, uh, we had like a 15% conversion rate out of the people that received this uh, direct mail, uh, which was previewed by uh, by email. That's good. I think, uh, yeah. Michael, what is your, uh, you have a lot of experience in cross-channel marketing, right? So um, you mentioned me something about lead scoring. Can you explain mm -hmm. how, th how that works and how you practice that? Yeah. Um, well, I see in, the, in, in some companies that um, once they want to start with omnichannel marketing, then they have to get the, 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 the best, uh, tools uh, where they specifically do not have the, um, how should I say it, uh, the, the, the knowledge for. Um, but you can start very, uh, very easy. And um, well, I've got, uh, uh, Liana is here from, uh, from Dela. And, uh, it's an insurance company for, um, for uh, funerals. And what I did there in assignment, uh, still one week to go, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, is we did a lead scoring and uh, we looked at the email channel. And where we had, uh, we were now at the moment, that, um, we use taxonomies. So in every link that we use in the email, um, we get uh, the interest. We get, uh, we say something about the product. We say something about the activity. And what he's doing? Is he? Uh, does he want to have contact? Does he make a calculation? And all those uh, taxonomies will come together in the database. And for each click, or each open, or each specific interest, or each specific point, it's just a stomach feeling now that we say, OK, if you get one point, maybe it should be three or five. Um, but what we can do with that is, uh, well, hopefully the first will go out at the end of uh, the first quarter, uh, that we can do a next best action. And it's based on the behavior. Uh, the customers who received an email and opened and clicked and maybe went online. Um, and uh, together with uh, the predictive model, so we use what's the scoring in a predictive model, is likely to buy, most likely to buy, together with the combination of the points that he collected. And then we send out the next section and it, it, it gives the possibility to use those taxonomies also in all Facebook posts. On every click on Facebook, when we get back from the, the, the DMP, that we know uh, where he got the points from. So you can decide for your next election. He's got a total now of 100 points. Uh, 40 points are for product A, 20 points are for product B, and 10 points are for product C. It's not 100 points, then, but it was late yesterday. <laughs> and, um, and then you know what your next best action is. You can send an email with that product. If the points are, um, are equal, 50-50, then you can make a newsletter with both products and then Look again where he clicks on and collect more points. So that's that's very basic. But machine learning is what most people say. Oh, we want machine learning, but you can start pretty easy, just using the right taxonomies over all your channels, and then hopefully 
Later on this year, you can also use the same pay to send out via different channels if wanted by the customer. Cool. Thanks. <coughs> so, Dave, um, within your company, you were, you see a lot of examples like that. Um, <coughs> Data coming in through your intelligence platform. Yeah, yeah. So can you mention me some examples, maybe? Um, well, one really, really good one. one celebrity cruises. Uh, anybody ever been on a celebrity cruises cruise? No, it's the wrong demographic. Okay. <laughs> I'm not a baby booper. There we go. Okay. Um, but they did something really interesting. They, they first of all, they made a discovery. Was that more that people are more likely to book. Celebrity cruise, cruise, when they're already on a celebrity cruise, cruise. I know. And I thought, really? Then I started asking other travel companies, is this true? Do you actually market people when you know they're actually on the holiday or on the cruise? Yeah, absolutely we do. Why? Because people don't want it to end. So they're much more likely to book the next one when they're already active than they're not. Anyway, so Celebrity cruises thought, okay, well, what can we do? <coughs> so they realized, and this is going back to my point about sale in a way as a child, is that when someone is on a cruise, they're collecting the data because they have to give a card or something to say what room. Well, apparently they log that on the cruise. So if I'm sitting at a meal, it's logged that I've just had a meal. Or if I've been in the sauna treatment, it's logged that I've done that. So what they would do um, using the data that they were collecting in real time, so that's live data, they were starting to feed that into the emails that they were sending to those individuals during the cruise. So they eventually said, hi, Jennifer, or whatever the name was, um, you, we know you've been on uh, seven of our cruise lines, and you've been to these destinations, and you've now had four beauty treatments and 55 findings, so where are we going to go next? So I thought that was a really clever use. It was live, it was live data, um, it was cross-channel in the sense that it needed um, a live activity data to, to inform the, 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 data, you know, the content of, of email. So it, it actually also increased revenue by three times. So compared to all of their, what they call, in marketing efforts, that particular, involving that data, it you know, improved by three times. I thought it was really, really great. And it was also the only email they ever had, because it was very entertaining, moving graphics and the, see the tide coming in and out and pages turning. Um, it's the only email I've ever had where people reply, said, thanks, that was the best email I've ever had from anybody. So that was good. Yeah, no, that's one sort of my favorite example, really. Was that OK? Yeah. Um, Jeroen, how about you? Uh, we, today we talk a lot about cross-channel and how to <coughs> use data non-response in other channels, right? <laughs> so, do you have something to add to that, uh, looking at how you use email data in uh, programmatic? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Actually, like um, what we do, is we often put email in at the center of it. And uh, there's one, uh, for instance, a uh, campaign that we run a couple of times a year. And um, who's re um, familiar with the concept of restaurant week? Yeah. Well, it's, it's basically like that. It's called the magazine 10 days. And um, it basically what it does is it offers consumers amazing deals on their favorite magazine for only 10 days. And the reason we created this campaign is at basically a random moment uh, in the year, we wanted to create a sales boost. Like, this is the moment to get your favorite magazine. And, uh, and it works. But what we do is we often use email as a kind of like way to launch the campaign. So to like our beloved email subscribers, uh, which are a few hundred thousands, we tell them like, you have this unique advantage. There's a pre-sale view going on and uh, else can only start like uh, uh, next week, but you can already uh, 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 make use of this great offer the next, uh, next week. And what we then do is like, uh, we have of course like a group that's directly uh, converts, but the majority doesn't. So we look at like, for instance, the open openers and the non-openers, and we adjust like our marketing strategy in like the other channels. So that means that like somebody that opened the email, <coughs> but didn't click through or didn't convert, there's some kind of engagement, um, but there's just some little extra thing that 
needs to happen for this person to, uh, to consider it or to convert. So what we do is like we just, for instance, bidding strategies in, uh, in Google uh, um, uh, on it. Because we know that we don't have to offer as much anymore for somebody searching actively for uh, a search term that's written to our, our magazines. Uh, compared to somebody that's still fresh that hasn't been in contact with, uh, with any of our channels. Um, and in addition, just all of the we also retarget people, for instance, in other channels like Facebook. Uh, so we know this person received the email. We know um, perhaps even on which type of magazine this person uh, in the email. And that way, we're able to make it much more relevant. So instead of like uh, showing like a very broad uh, uh, Facebook message about like a ton of ma uh, magazines that are now uh, for sale, we can specifically say like, hey, your favorite magazine is now for sale. And if it takes too long for this person to convert, we can actually even offer extra. Like, but now you get this extra discount. And um, uh, that way you can optimize your, your campaign. Um, and it's all about like flexibility because that also means like a lot of adjusting because you, you see a large group uh, in a certain way. So that might mean that you have to set like, an extra email within your sales funnel or you have to skip some emails um, and change your, uh, your budget spends in, uh, in other channels. Yeah, nice. So this sounds really cool. So who, who doesn't want it? But the thing is, what's the amount of, what's the percentage of companies who have it, you know? It's, so. Yeah, it's, it's actually very, uh, very simple. Like, um, it all starts with the right permissions. So you have to uh, have permission to profile people. But once you have that, it's basically only like a matter of looking at your ESP statistics and uh, uploading like the email addresses that didn't uh, do what you want uploading them into Google Customer Match, uploading them into Facebook, and then retarget them to people. So you don't need like very specific tools for that to uh, be very intelligent about it. Um, once you have permission, you could just use the addresses and upload them uh, through other standard uh, channels. Yeah. So, um, Michael, what do you think is are the three, or how many you ever like, are the most um, uh, important to, uh, to deal with in order to be cross-channel? Mm -hmm. Most important things. I think uh, what I already mentioned, uh, first you have to, to take a deep dive in your data. What kind of data do I already have? Uh, and is the data channel, then it's difficult to use it cross-channel. Uh, so once you're able to collect all your data from all your different channels into one database, then the magic will appear. And um, so I think that's, you asked for three, but I want to keep it with one because I think this is the, oh, the most, the most in, <laughs> oh, okay, two and three. Uh, I think that's, that's the, the most important thing and what you already said and uh, we had it in a, in a phone call. Being on the channel doesn't mean that you have to use all channels to that specific customer. Uh, being on the channel uh, by my means uh, it means to me that um, you must be able to use the, the specific channel that each different customer wants to communicate with. And that starts with your data. Um, yeah, just, um, I, I've always, I, I'll be honest, email is not the sexiest uh, channel. Let's Excuse face it. me? <laughs> Sorry, I used, oh, I say something. So, um, but we, we, we work quite hard to try and make it a lot. Uh, video and moving things, and, uh, scratching something off and all that stuff, but it isn't. But I, I do think that um, it's probably underrated as a workhorse and um, you need to drive traffic to the other channels. So there's no reason why you can't use email with live social feeds, um, Instagram live social feeds, Facebook live social feeds. Um, going back to his example earlier, um, where um, not only parents might be opening the email, but the younger demographic that you're trying to target opening the email, um, we found brands increasing sign-ups to those social networks that they may not otherwise have been following on Facebook, um, up to four times, five times, in some brands' cases over a period of time. So, so, so that's um, one of the thoughts is, you know, let email. Can I just ask a quick question? Um, 
how many people are still marketing to, in, in your environment, how many people are still marketing to a, a user once they've purchased, sort of beyond the transactional email? Do they, how many of you make them pass through a veil and you start to treat them differently in email once they've purchased rather than pre-purchased? Anybody got that as a strategy? Yeah, yeah. okay. So I think email is a unique channel for that because you actually um, had to use the transactional email to do the, to do the business. So once you've crossed the line, then, um, to quote Della from a previous conference, um, you should be all over them like a rash because um, you, you, own, you know, you, you love them. And um, it's sort of similar. Yeah, you love them. So yes, so. I was abbreviating. Email and the other part of it is um, people don't really mention each other. I, I absolutely, um, my cousin, um, sorry, nephew, my, uh, recently, um, I asked, um, I need a copy of point from, from a computer. Um, and I'm looking for a version. He said, Oh, uh, don't, don't bother Googling. He said, YouTube it. And uh, some guy, hack it and you can just download it for free and I said well, why is that on YouTube? He said oh nobody, none of my mates use Google or Yahoo and we just all, all use YouTube so um, the ability to bring those videos into email when, you're, when you've done the modelling and you've done the targeting and you know the demographic influencers and bloggers and vloggers are on YouTube then I think that's another but also then drive them back to subscribe to those channels Anybody who's not driving subscriptions on YouTube is missing out, in my opinion, big time anyway. But so, yeah, that's my. Yes, I hear a lot about using other channels besides email, but I would like to also challenge uh, think around, right? So your customers on your website, on your social channels, uh, they click on the display ads, uh, but once you can recognize them, Email address is the most valuable piece of knowledge of your customer you have. That's my belief. Uh, uh, it, it, it gives you the biggest volume in, in terms of reach. Uh, and reach is, is probably um, uh, talking about uh, to get more conversion. We always think of frequency and, um, and relevant. Mm. But if you, it's, it's about numbers. So I think I think there's a uniqueness. Sorry. Just, uh, I meant, meant to mention that. It's also a uniqueness in that the other, many of the other channels are, are community-based. It's about social interaction with the community, whereas email is particularly individual. Um, it's you talking to me individually, not the community talking to get. It can help drive community, but it is unique, I think, in that, in that sense. Yeah. And besides the purchase, because then you get the email address mainly, and um, uh, behavior what you just mentioned, mm -hmm. click on the website, click on Facebook, it gets a face once somebody gives you his email address. And, oh, yeah. this is the one behind all the behavior that I got, and that's powerful to use. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's the technology that drives innovation, right? Exactly. So with all these new technologies coming up and, and um, bridging all these channels, now uh, uh, yeah, able to, uh, to do this. Yeah. Yeah. So what is your biggest challenge? within Sanoma of being successful in all these channels? Um, well, like, we, we have like a lot of challenges, but I think uh, especially like technological uh, challenges. Um, it's not that we don't have the technology, it's not that we don't have the, the, the data, uh, but we always wanna, wanna have it faster, right? So, um, and uh, yeah, um, um, there's, all, uh, there's never enough uh, IT so capacity. Is it a technology challenge or a resource? Um, well, I think I think both. I think both because once you have them, um, how do you get the maximum out of it? And um, so we have like a, a large uh, database management team. So there are no research issues uh, issues there. Um, but for instance, also what you say, like connecting like those other channels, be personal. Like uh, somebody clicks on. And what instantly changes on your website? What instantly changes in other other channels? To make that work is labor intensive, 
Uh, and it's not always easy to prove uh, that it actually works then. We, uh, we had like uh, a very extensive personalization programs in which we looked like, okay, somebody that comes from email or comes from display, uh, we're going to show them different content on our, on our website. And it worked flawlessly, uh, but it took us a lot of work. And in terms of like improved conversion rates, uh, we were never fully able to prove it. And we saw like, yeah, this conversion rate goes up with, uh, by 10%, and then, yeah, it goes down by uh, 3%. Um, so like, I, I think the biggest challenge is um, uh, technology in combination with people. Like it's not always just uh, about having a lack of resources, but it's also like, how do you get everything out of technology uh, on paper is, is offering you. So I would like to ask the audience, um, what topic didn't we discuss here? Do you have some ideas about that? Which fits to the program. Huh? <laughs> Other questions probably? In front here. Um, can you tell me what, what tools do you use to automatically import, for example, the customer list in Google or uh, Facebook? Because I do it manually. It requires a lot of work because I have to hatch it all. And what APIs or tools do you use to? Jeroen, do you know? Um, well, basically, we also do it manually because um, it gives you like a lot of control. Um, of course, there are like the, uh, direct uh, exports and uh, exports, and, and you can like have that automatically managed. Um, but because we're still learning about it, and we still want to create like the maximum effect of it, uh, we actually prefer doing it manually uh, as well. And that takes a lot of uh, a lot of work, but it also provides like a lot of valuable insights that we're able to use throughout our. Somebody else in the room who knows an answer to this question or an opinion about it. Okay, fine. Oh, on the left. Hold on. Matthias. This data exchange and so on is always a hot topic because you, sometimes you have the resources to build APIs and all the stuff, but the thing is uh, those other technology companies, they, they move fast and they comply and, and, and so on and so on. So those APIs move also fast. So if somebody already tried to build something on a Facebook API, uh, you, you better hire one person just to, to take care of that because once it's broken, well, you stop back to the manual. So uh, yeah. at some times, uh, some processes you need to uh, you need basically to, to, to master them and continue to master them, simplify them. Maybe what you do automatically, um, and at some point, I think it will uh, it will stabilize. There will be maybe sometimes some vendors that simplifies that, but uh, knowing what you're doing, I think, is uh, is, is really important. So. Yeah. Some other questions? No? Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Thank you, Okay. <laughs>